All right. Before the break, what we did, we looked at a parallel treatment of the MOSFET and bipolar BJTs and MOSFETs of their small signal model. And we saw that small signal model is really a way of looking at a nonlinear behavior and looking at the perturbation around an operation point in that nonlinear point. And we saw that for BJTs, for example, the most important part of the, the, the operation the tra is the transistor part, the transisting part of the transistor, quote unquote, is the transconductance, GM, or 1 over RM. And we saw, we developed an expression for GM in both bi bipolar and MOSFET. And we compared them, we saw that they, they behave differently, they depend on different parameters. Essentially, the gate overdrive in a non-velocity saturated device would determine the GM in a MOSFET, and the collector current would determine the GM in a bipolar transistor. So now, if you think about that, if you start with that, and then try to create a model. Now, we said this is we have linearized it, so we can now deal with a linear model. So we will try to develop a linear model for these two transistors. So if let's, let's try to do that. So the good part of the transistor is going to be essentially the GM. So now what, what we mean by GM, we saw that GM was the derivative or ratio, the derivative of the collector current with respect to the base emitter voltage. So it is fair to think about it. There are two different draw, uh, models that we'll discuss. But so this is the so-called hybrid pi model in that if you think about the three terminals, and now we show in this model, we show these three terminals with lowercase letters. To emphasize, so when we show these terminals with lowercase letters, we are really trying to emphasize the fact that this is the model of the perturbation on top of the operation point. Now, that model is a linear model. And basically, this, there's a current voltage-dependent current source, V pi, and it's shown here. You can also show it as VBE lowercase vb, which is equal to v pi. You can say, if my vbe, I fluctuate the vbe, as you see in that upper picture, down here, the fluctuation in the vbe, that red fluctuation, produces a fluctuation in the current in the IC. So this is really, this fluctuations, the red ones, are the IC. And it's basically saying that the collector current is modulated by the base emitter voltage. So this is the good part of the transistor. So let me actually since trying to come. Emitter and the base. Um, and this being VBE or V pi, um, and that's the good part of the transistor. Now, the same thing for the MOSFET, right? We can do a similar, we can draw a similar model for the MOSFET. And again, since it's the ratio of a similar terminals, this is the drain, this is the gate, and this is the source. Now, with the MOSFET, we have to be careful because we know that we have a fourth terminal, the bulk, which we haven't talked about yet. And we'll see how it comes into play soon. But so far, we've drawn these three terminals. And then we have the good part of the transistor, the, the useful part of the transistor, which is this transconductance. Let's do it in green to differentiate it. So this is GM. Now, you could call it VPi, or we could call it VGS. Now, Interestingly, it's more common to call this VGS in a MOSFET and not call it VPi, and call it VPi in bipolar transistors, and not call it VGS. But as far as I'm concerned, they are the same thing. So, yeah, I mean, these models were done for different people as, you know, one of them. So, so you know, the reason that there are these differences in the way they're drawn, the way they're modeled, and things of that sort, is that people develop that reasonable model first. And we'll see um, examples of that. And then some other people try to differentiate their work from other people. They gave them a different name. They drew them differently. They did these different things. So just say, OK, no, we are different. This is the new method. OK? Now, and that's why I'm always a fan of going back to the original work and seeing, OK, what, what, what were they thinking originally? And if that still makes sense, I would use it. And we'll see that actually even I think, as we'll see, in 80% of circuit design that we deal with, the pi model is not the best model to use. 
It's actually the T model, which was the original used. And everyone now used it because the original books that were written on this subject <laughs> were written with T models. And then a whole bunch of people came in and said, well, how can we write new books to differentiate ourselves? So we, they introduced this hybrid pi model. And then hybrid pi model became something that became the standard thing. And we'll see that it doesn't facilitate analysis in many cases, in 80% of the cases. There are times that it's useful, so we'll introduce both models. But anyway, let's start with the pi model, and we'll get to the T model in a few, few minutes. But OK, so that's, that we knew already. I so, said, well, OK, what, what are you telling me so far? So this is the good part of the transistor. Now, what else is there in our transistor that we need to take into account? Now, is there some incremental resistance that needs to be between the base and the emitter for the bipolar transistor? Why? That is correct. The answer is yes. But why? Why is there some incremental resistance that you need to take into account? There are different ways to think about it. The easiest way is that there's some base current. If I apply voltage here, I draw a current. So if this two term, if as a two-terminal device, there's a non-zero non resistance, or non-infinity resistance, more accurately, a non-zero conductance. So I apply voltage, current goes in. I increase the voltage, the current increases. I decrease the current, the current decreases. So incrementally, there is some resistance. It doesn't mean that if I apply negative voltage here, the current will go backward. Because remember, this is an incremental current. It means that an increase will result in increasing the current, a decrease will result in decreasing the current. So as an incremental perturbation perspective, there should be a resistance here. Right? So this resistance, so now we have to pick colors for different things. OK, let's show this is blue. Let's call this R pi, because it's sitting in parallel with the V pi. Now, R pi, by definition, if it's an incremental resistance, it's going to be DIB to DVBE inverse, right? It's the, ratio, the, the ratio of the change in the current versus voltage, that's the conductance, so one over that would be the resistance. So now, this quantity, though, is not that hard to calculate, because I mean, there's a relationship between IB and IC. Right? So if you plug that in, it becomes clear that this is beta times DIC over DVBE. But we know this quantity already. We have already calculated it on the upper whiteboard. What is that in purple? It's the transconductance. It's GM. So this is beta over GM, or beta RM. So at 1 milliamp, and let's say if beta were 100, you're looking at 2.5 kilo ohms. Not too high, not too low. Right? And of course, as you increase GM or RM, this, this changes its resistance. Another way to see this is that you, if you remember earlier, we developed this equivalent nonlinear model, right? We had a diode here and a trans transistor here. So we said this was beta IB, and this current IB was IS over beta E to the VBE over VT. So this was the model we had developed. And you can see we're going from this to that. So we are another way to think about all of this is that we are linearizing this nonlinear pi model. OK, so that's, that's one element that's quite important. There's another element. Now, in this picture, if you change the VC collector emitter voltage, there should be no change in the collector current. You see no dependence on the collector current, or, or, of the collector current on the voltage it's experiencing. But we know this is not true, right? We know we've seen these pictures before. We've seen these pictures of ID versus v, VCE, right? So if you look at VCE and IC, sorry, not ID, versus different VBEs, we know that there's a slope here. And there's an intercept point down here, right? Or here. And this was negative VA. So what happens is that 
there is another, so there must, so how can we model that? Because a current source will not change its current versus a change in the voltage, right? So there should be another resistor in parallel with it. So it's not an ideal current source. So there should be another resistor here. We call it the RO because this is usually the output resistance. This is the output resistance. So what is RO? So RO is going to be DIC, DVCE inverse. One over that, right? But we also know from the definition of the early voltage what this is. DIC DVC is IC over VA, right? So if you bring that in and write it in there, you clearly see that this is going to be VA over IC. Now, early voltage for a PNP can be anywhere between, like, let's say, 50 to 100. Typical PNP is 50 to 100 volts. So for one milliamp, this is going to be what? Let's say it's 100. VA is 100 volts. It's going to be 100 kilo ohms. So this is a rather large resistor. This is a larger resistor, significantly larger, a couple orders of magnitude larger than that resistor. Just to get a feel for these resistors. Because then you will sometimes say, well, this resistor really doesn't matter. So for example, if this guy was in parallel with that guy, most of the times it doesn't matter. It's just the R pi. Or if that was in series with some small resistance, that would also not matter. So remember, there are three resistances we are talking about. Rm, R pi, and Ro. R, let's say at a milliamp, Rm is on the order of a couple tens, right? 20, 25 ohms. R pi is on the order of kilo ohms, 2.5 kilo ohms. And RO is on the order of hundreds of kilo ohms. So they are all about like an order of magnitude apart. A couple, two orders of magnitude apart. So it's a RO, RM to R, R, RM to R pi, a couple orders of magnitude, and R pi to RO, another couple orders of magnitude. At least in the bipolar. Now we'll see that for short channel MOSFET this may be a little bit different, but again, that's that's the case. So so we have those resistors, and we've mod calculated the model for them. Now the other thing is, um, how about the MOSFET? Let's talk about the MOSFET. So let's go and do these things. What is is there an R pi in the MOSFET equivalent? Should there be one? No, right? Because that current, at least in the classical model, if there's no gate current, there's no tunneling current, that would be zero. So that current, since it's zero, its derivative is also zero. So it's going to be not going to per be perturbed. So that there's no resistance here, really, in this classical model. Now, how about an RO? Well, we can calculate the RO, right? I mean, the same way. So RO would be what, by definition? DID dv ds inverse. And again, from the definition of lambda or 1 over uh, VA, we have this. So you can write it as um, you can write it as basically VA over IC. Oh, I'm sorry, ID, or 1 over lambda ID. Now, if you remember, VA or lambda had a dependence on L effective, right? VA for MOSFET was L effective, or L, right? Does anyone remember what it was? L effective, DXD, DVDS, Inverse. So we said this is kind of some sort of a constant, but that one is VA. So overall, what you will get in something like that is that your RO is proportional to your L, the channel length. Now, this is a knob that you have in the design with MOSFET. That's another advantage of a MOSFET, because you have really control over the W and L. And what this knob does, it allows you to control the RO. While in a bipolar, your RO is really controlled by an intrinsic parameter, v, or built-in parameter, VA, the device parameter for that given device, and the current. And if you are trying to operate at higher currents, your RO will drop. We'll see that you want to actually have high RO, because you want it to look as much as close to an ideal current source as possible. 
And if you want something to look as close to an ideal current source, the parallel resistance should be as high as possible. So, but this is a useful thing. It means that if I really need to increase my output resistance, and there are cases that you need to increase your output resistance, especially if you want to get gain, you have this knob to turn that you don't. Why is it that you have this knob in the MOSFET, but you don't have it in the bipolar VJT? So this is a question for you. Why do we have this knob in the MOSFET, but not in the bipolar? Any thoughts? Here's your hint. Look at the way they are built. What determines the VA in a bipolar? Yes. Well, I was going to say that in the MOSFET, you have variable uh, channel width. Right, exactly. So, exactly, that's correct. So, so remember, these effects, both the early effect and channel length modulation, is controlled really by, in the, in the bipolar, it's controlled by the width of the base, right? We talked about it. He said, if the base is very narrow, yes, of course, we can control the doping level, so the collector is lower dope than, than the base, so most of the depletion is on that side, but still, it's the change in the width of the base that, that induces that, right? So your base width in the bipolar is fixed because it's built vertically, right? This is the cross section. This is your base width. So once you've built it, it's done. I mean, and all of them are made in a batch process. So all of them are, have the same depth that you control by the implantation. So you design a certain depth, certain base width, and that's done. That's fixed. So you have no control. This is the equivalent of an L in a MOSFET, right? You have no control over that. You get what you get. In a MOSFET, though, it's a design parameter because you can draw it wider or you can draw it narrower. You can make the L increase, increase the L, decrease the L, reduce the W. Or, so, and as such, that's another reason for popularity of MOSFET, because there's a more versatile device. You have more knobs to turn. Engineers love knobs, right? We like to have more controlling parameters. And that's basically one of the advantages of a MOSFET over a bipolar. So going back to this thing, so that you can see that your RO has this dependence on L. So it, it becomes a design parameter which is not the case in the case of a bipolar transistor. All right, any questions on that? No? So, so far it appears that actually MOSFET is a simple, so, so I have to put that in, sorry. So this is the RO. It appears that MOSFET has a simpler model, right? Yes, no, maybe. Have we forgotten something that MOSFET has and bipolar doesn't? Have you forgotten a fourth terminal by any chance? The bulk. The, the, yeah, the bulk, yeah. yeah, it, yeah it, to differentiate it from, I mean, it logically makes sense to call it base, but we, to differentiate it from the bipolar, we call it the bulk or the substrate. So MOSFET really has a fourth terminal, right? It's here and here. This is the bulk. The bulk. And we know, we talked about this extensively, there is a second transistor. Under the MOSFET, there's a JFET. That depletion region and all those things can be controlling the stuff. So there's, there's a second transistor, a JFET, that shares its drain and source with the MOSFET. So there are really two transistors that are in parallel, which have two different gates. So what about that? What do we do about that? Well. If you have a second transistor, it will have another transconductance, right? This is called the body effect or bulk effect. So what does that do? Let's look at that. Now, that one, so let's see. How would it modulate the transistor? How would, so we say, wait a second, but I don't see it in this equation. It's not here in the equations that you gave me in either one of these. Where is that voltage? Where is that bulk voltage? How is it influencing the drain current? Why are you telling me that I have to worry about that? It's not there. Where is it? In the threshold voltage, exactly, right? This, remember, was a function of VSB. What was the functionality? So if I write it here, for example, 
you remember V threshold was VT0 plus gamma square root of 2 phi F plus VSB minus square root of 2 phi F. So the threshold does depend on the source bulk voltage. So I can define, we can define a um, transconductance associated with that. What would that transconductance be? How would we define it? Well, the definition, let's call it GMB for bulk or body effect, is DIC, DID, the drain current changes, with respect to VBS, bulk source. OK? Now, if I do that, if you define it this way, you can see that from that expression up there, right, the only thing, if you ignore that channel length modulation for now, from this expression, so forget about this part of it, the only part that's a function of VBS is this guy. So it would be the derivative of this, so it would basically this comes, cancels that guy, so you're left with a GM, this a term like this, plus, uh, or times, the derivative of VT with respect to VBS. So it would simply be mu n C ox W over L, VGS minus VT or delta VGS, the gate overdrive, D VT D VBS. And then this thing with that minus sign, according to this orange expression, is going to be the only thing that depends on VBS or VSB in that orange expression is that first square root. Right? So we have to calculate the derivative of that, which basically is going to be gamma over 2 square root of 2 phi f plus VSB. Now, and therefore, GM, GMB, now you recognize, some of, you, you, I'm sure you all recognize this. What is this? Look at the upper whiteboard. That's the GM, right? So this thing is really, you can write it as some constant times GM which we call chi. Now, chi is defined as this, but very interestingly, chi actually happens to be the ratio of the junction capacitance of the substrate, only that, substrate, that, that half of it that comes to the channel, because it has one-sided junction. So that's only the lower part of it. It doesn't have the opposite side, because the other side is balanced by the capacitance of the uh, gate over the gate oxide capacitance. Now, if you think about this expression, this is an insightful expression, this last form. What is the insight? Remember, chi is simply the ratio of GMB to GM. It's the ratio of the strength of that back transistor, that JFET, or back gate transistor, to the front transistor, to the main transistor, right? And it says that ratio is exactly the same as the ratio of the two capacitances. Because this is a field effect transistor. right? You induce the channel, you modulate the channel through the field. So the capacitance that's larger has a stronger coupling to the channel. Because one side of both of these, these capacitors is the channel in the middle. One is coming from behind, one is coming from the bo bottom, one is coming from the top. right? So it's the ratio of strengths of these two capacitances that determines the ratio of the strength of these two transistors, really. So now, now we have a decision to make, a very important one. Should we use green or blue to show this current source? Where is that current source? Again, it's modulating the drain, drain, drain source current. Remember, this transistor is in parallel. It shares the same drain and source. So it would be in parallel with this guy. So should I use a blue or a green in your mind? This is completely subjective, right? But no, not completely, but, uh, practically. So uh, what do you think, green or blue? Green, green, green. green. Any, any votes for blue? Blue, blue, okay, so we have, okay, so we have. 
uh, both of you could be correct. I mean, so this is, as I said, this is subjective. I personally would use blue because it's more of a nuisance most of the times. There are some scenarios, there are some topologies where this is useful, but in most, of, more, more scenarios than not, it is a nuisance. And we'll see when it's useful and when it's not, when we do the different topologies. So Elliot doesn't agree with me, but that's okay. We can use a green, we can use tur turquoise or teal. <laughs> All right, anyway, so let's pick one. You know what, I'm gonna, in recognition of desire to think about this as a potentially positive thing, I can do this. How about that? So it could be useful, it's not useful. Anyway. Anyway, so, so that's the basic low frequency model of a MOSFET, a pi model. But we're not done yet. There's a fair amount of things to be derived. But before we do any more derivation, let's look at this and talk about something else. Let's talk about these two models are the pi model. What I just said a few minutes ago, that this is really practically not the best model, in my opinion, for most of the transistor analysis. Because, for a variety of reasons, and we'll get to see them as we go. The model that's more physical and the more realistic, and it actually happens to be more useful for analysis, in many cases, not always, is the T model. So we'll use both of them. Don't, don't take me wrong. I mean, there will be cases where, where whichever one is more useful to us or easier to, for analysis, we'll use that. So it's important we're familiar with that. But now, we can convert this to T model. There are different ways to do this. You can do a direct conversion, or you can use the original T model, that the large signal T model that you developed. Now, if you want to do a direct conversion, what you can do is that you can use the source uh, transportation theorem, meaning that I can take this current source, remove it, take this current source from here to there, and take this current source from that there to here. So introduce two new current sources. I'm just going to temporarily show them with pink, and then I'm going to remove them, because I want to keep this model. So if I make a GMV pi from here and a GMV pi from here, okay, and remove this, that would be equivalent, right? Because there's, there's the same amount of current still leaving this node, there's the same amount of current entering this node, and there's no net current entering this node, because you're taking out the same thing that you're putting in. So these two should be equivalent, if I remove the green and replace it with the, two, with the pink. But here's the question. Yeah, this one is what it is, it is what it is, but how about this one? Can you think of this, what is a current source whose current is proportional to its own voltage? Because now V pi is the voltage across the current source, right? It has a name. What is the name of a current source whose current is proportional to its own voltage? It's called a resistor. And its resistance is 1 over GM, or its conductance is GM. So now you have a GM, or RM, in parallel with beta RM. So you have a RM in parallel with beta RM. What is that parallel combination? It's beta RM times RM divided by beta RM plus RM. One of the RMs cancels, so you get beta over 1 plus beta, right, times RM. What is beta over 1 plus beta? It has a name, it comes before beta, alpha. Because you remember alpha, alpha was defined, beta, I'm sorry, beta was defined as alpha over one minus alpha. And if you solve for that, you will see that alpha is beta over one plus beta. And when you put them in parallel, so this becomes alpha RM. So the new model for the transistor, the T model, which is the original model, in fact, that people used and, and produced, looks like this. You have alpha RM, and now this current is IE. What is this current, if that is IE? This is the collector current. How is, it how is the collector current related to the emitter current? We, this was the first thing we defined, and then we derived other things from that. Was, what is IC in terms of IE? Alpha IE, alpha e, right? This is the definition of alpha. So this is the base, this is the collector, this is the emitter. Now, this model is more realistic, more physical, because you can actually see 
the, the NPN junction in it, you can see that it's this current mostly flowing. So it is the emitter current that's mostly appearing across the collector. And the difference of them is the base current. The difference between IE and alpha IE is the base current. This current is 1 minus alpha IE. Right? So this shows what's happening in the transistor. It happens to be actually a pretty useful model in terms of analysis. Too. And of course, the RO is sitting here. Well, I didn't. I messed up my color convention, but it's OK. And similarly here, so let's, let's, let's see what happens here. Now, by the way, where is this other terminal? There is no B. So, so, so we have to put a fourth terminal in our model somewhere. So we can say, this is the B. And this is the VBS in that model. So the bulk, whatever it's connected to. Usually it's connected to ground. Now, in this model, if I want to convert this model to that model, or to a T model, how would I do that? Well, I need to do the same thing, same operation, with both of these sources. For this guy, I take it from here to there and from there to there. Right? The same thing that we did with the bipolars. And what do we get? So in this case, you will get, now what is, gonna be, what is this resistance going to be? The one that's left when you have this current source going from the gate to the source. It's Rm, right? And there's no R pi for it to be parallel with. So there is no alpha. It is just going to be Rm, right? And what is this current going to be? Again, it is going to be the same current. So it's going to be, if this is, let's call it Is1, this is going to be IS1. And what does that make this current? The gate current. Zero. Right? So this is going to be the drain. This is going to be the source. And that's the gain. Now, the RO is sitting here. So that's for the main transistor, the MOSFET. How about the JFET? Where is the JFET? Or that back gate transistor? How do we model that? How do we turn it into something that's similar to this? What do we need to do with this current source? Where do we need to take it to and back? Which node? You want to go get to a node that at least for one of those two current sources, it would be a current source whose current depends on its own voltage. What is its own voltage? VBS. So I need to take this from here, take it to this node and bring it back to this node. So if I remove this guy and replace it with these two of the same value, it would do the same thing, right? Because the net current injected in this node is zero. The net current taken out of this node is the same, if I remove this and replace it with that. The net current injected into this node is the same. Now, but this one is GMB VBS, and the voltage across it is VBS. So what is the resistance? RMB, or 1 over GMB, right? So, and then that other current source is simply there. So what you have, this is your bulk terminal. This is RMB, and this is G, uh, well, and this is the same current. So let's call it IS2. This is going to be IS2. Now, and this way, you can even more clearly see the two parallel transistors. This is the front MOSFET, and this is the back JFET. This is the gate. This current, all of the current goes through the channel. There's no gate channel. There's no current. There's no gate channel, uh, gate current, sorry. There's no gate current, and there's no bulk current. So this is the equivalent T model equivalent of that, and this is the T model. The reason it's called T model, if you put it sideways, it looks like a T, if you do it this way. If you rotate it in negative 90 degrees, it's called the T model. And, and that one's called a hybrid pi model, because if once you have elements there, it looks like a Greek pi. Any questions so far? All right, good. Is this clear? Does it make sense? So everything we've done so far, as far as our models are concerned, are static, or 
DC, low frequency stuff. Now what about high frequency stuff? Then we have to think about the capacitances in the device, right? We have to think what else do we need to add here. So I'm going to remove this pink stuff from the hybrid pi model now that we've derived them. But now you know this is how it's generated. So let's go to the dynamic stuff. Now we have capacitances in the system. We have to think about those. And those capacitances are important because they determine the frequency response of the system. So let's find out what they are. What kind of capacitors do we have in a BJT? If you think about the BJT, you bring the BJT back and think about it, say this guy. Where are the capacitors. Well, the capacitors are where charge can be stored. Right? So what kind of capacitances do we have? What do you see here? Do you see anything that produces a capacitance whose capacitance we've calculated before? The junctions, right? You have the two p-n junctions. So those p-n junctions have, a capaci have capacitances associated with them. And these capacitances will have an impact, will have some significance in the performance of the device. So we need to take them into account. So that's one thing we need to take into account. What else do we need to take into account? So let, let's, take them, let's start taking them into account. The junction capacitors are actually pretty more straightforward to take into account in the sense that you can say, well, there are two junctions. There's a CJE, the base emitter junction, capacitance associated with that. And then there's a CJC, the collector junction capacitor, collector base junction. So both of these guys have a CJ. We know that the junction capacitance can be written. We did this before, right? As some sort of a junction capacitance zero, one plus. So in this case, it would be V B E, or V yeah, or it would be V E B really, over some psi one to the power of some m, some coefficient. We saw that this is a nonlinear capacitance. We derive the junction capacitance expression, and then we have the C J C zero over one plus some V C B psi two to the power of M2, that is the M1. So we know that this coefficient, this exponential exponent, depends on what? What determines this exponent? You've done a problem set on this already. The profile of the doping, right? This is the built in potential. And this is the junction capacitance value at zero bias, when there's zero bias. So this is the built in capacitance for the zero bias. So those are the junction capacitances, fine. Is there anything else? Any other junction capacitance before we get to the other capacitances? Is there any other junction that you can recognize? Well, not in this picture, right? But how about this picture if I draw the bottom part of it? Because to create isolation, if you have more than one transistor, you, this probably has to be a p-type for it to be reverse biased. So there's another junction here. There's another diode that's reverse biased here, a substrate. We call this CJ S for the substrate. And it will have a similar expression to these guys. So that would be CJS, which would have a similar expression. So CJS0 over 1 plus. Now, this is basically the junction, the, co the collector substrate voltage, um, psi 3 and M3. So there are three junction capacitances. Where do we put them on the model? So where are they? The first one, CJB. Yes, question. Oh, OK, good question. So, so she's asking, so why does the substrate need to be p-doped? What happens if you make it n-doped and you have another transistor next, right next to it? The collectors are shorted, right? Because they're connected through n-type material. So if you make it well, if you make it intrinsic, still the depletion re then the depletion region extends very quickly. So you have a depletion region. If you have an intrinsic level, in truly intrinsic level, the depletion region goes to infinity, right? So the depletion region of these two will start touching each other. So they will not be electrically isolated, really, because there's no potential barrier between them. Good thinking. So so I, I like the way you're thinking about it. But you need to kind of like practically, you need to make it p-type and have a reverse bias junction to isolate them. There's a, this is not the only way, by the way. There's another way. You can actually make these 
what we call a deep trench isolation. You can actually make an insulator trench and separate them by that. But typically, this is the most vanilla kind of transistor. And that's the way they are. So, so there's that junction. Now, if it's not there, it's not there, right? You just need to don't, don't, don't worry about it. So where are these capacitors, though? Where is CJE? That's between the base and emitter, right? So there is a capacitance here. We call it CJB. I'm sorry, CJE. And where is the other one? CJ, CJC, the, the one between base and collector, right? So that's sitting here. And then where is CJS? It's hanging off of this guy to ground. Because your bulk is generally connected to some fixed potential ground, which is AC ground. DC potentials, fixed DC potentials are AC ground in the small signal model, right? In the perturbation model. It's a constant whose derivative would be zero. So anything that's connected to a fixed DC voltage is considered zero in the AC small signal model, because there's no perturbation on it. A voltage source is not going to be there. So, so these are the ones that we talked about. But is there anything else in that transistor that stores charge? We talked about this, this briefly before. Right? When we developed the dynamic model for the transistor, we saw that there's this minority charge storage in the base that looked like a triangle, et cetera, et cetera, more or less the profile. Right? That charge, that QF. And we know that QF, so what we know is that QF was what? So we knew that basically IC was QF over tau F. The collector current was determined by that charge anyway. So now, if I want to define a capacitance associated with that charge, it makes sense for that capacitance to be defined as dQF dVBE, right? Or you can make it partial, because they can, in principle, be functions of multiple things. So what is dQF dVBE? Well, we know what QF is. So it's going to be dIC tau F divided by dVBE. So if you assume that tau f was constant versus VBE, it doesn't depend on VBE at least, um, then you get this. But this is a known quantity. The fractional changes in the collector current versus VBE. This was the first thing we derived. This is a transconductance. This is GM. So this is GM tau f. So there's, a, there's another capacitance here, which is sitting really between VBE. And it's, associated, it's because of the charge that's stored inside the base. This is the charge storage capacitance. So the total capacitance, we sometimes call this combination, these two together, C pi, and we call this capacitance sometimes C mu. C pi because it's sitting in parallel with the V pi. OK? Now, how about MOSFETs? What are the capacitors for the MOSFETs? Now, we did a couple calculations. So similarly, if you have a MOSFET, if you think about the structure of a MOSFET, you have a gate and two drains. So you have a gate oxide, and then you have a gate. Now you have some overlap and some fringe fields here. So there's some classic capacitance between the gate and these devices, and the drain and source. right? We call these two capacitances um, C, uh, G, D, and C, G, S. But we call, let's call them C overlap for now, because it's because of the overlap of the field, C overlap. So that's part of the capacitance. You also have these junctions to ground because of the back side. So let's say if this was n type, n type, you have two PN junctions here that they have their own capacitances. So this is going to be CSB and CDB from the source to bulk and drain to bulk, if this is the bulk. And these are junction capacitors. So we'll have similar expressions as these. Okay. 
So those are the sum of the classes. But in pinch off, we did calculate something. We calculated the total charge in the channel. You remember we integrated the charge across the channel, and we had this integral that gave what was what. But do you remember what that channel charge was? So there was a channel charge in the pinch off region, which is the region we are mostly interested in. Was what? Do you remember? So there's a WLC ox element to it, and there's a VGS minus VT, which is the inversion charge. But there was a factor of two thirds when we did that integration. You remember? It was a quadratic we integrated, so it became cubic and so it gave one third. So that was what it was. So if I define now a capacitance, so C channel, which I define it as dQ with, D, with respect to dVGS, what do I get? Well, I know that my VGS, so this is the only part that depends on VGS, so I simply get 2 thirds of WLC ox. So now I have two a bunch of capacitors here, right? the wrong one. Um, so I have, so what do we have? We have the C overlap here for the overlap of the field, fringe fields and all that. So you have C overlap here. You have a capacitance between here, C, B, uh, B did I say, uh, yeah, S, B or B, S. And then you have another capacitance through here, C, D, B. I think we called it C, S, B. Doesn't matter, either way. And then we have the channel charge capacitance, which is this guy, C channel. And again, you can combine these two and call it C pi, or in MOSFET more commonly they call it C, G, S, and look at that and call it C, G, D, or C, mu. But it has different components. OK. So, so that's for that. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about today is how do these things come together to define the frequency response of a transistor? So now, we want to define a parameter that would tell you when does the transistor stop being useful. Now, this parameter can be tricky because as we'll see later, there are some subtleties that will allow it to be used even above these frequencies. But in a simplistic perspective, for a bipolar transistor, let's say, if you're thinking about it as having a gain of beta, right? you put a collector co base current into it, and then you get a collector current out. Now, if you're looking at something like that, when would it be, become useless? In other words, the question is, when does a wire perform better than your transistor in terms of amplifying the current? When that current regain, the ratio of the IC to IB becomes what? One, right? So that's what we call the cutoff frequency of the transistor. And the way you actually practically would measure it is by applying some bias to the transistor. So you have some VCC, you're monitoring the IC, and you're putting some IB while you have some fixed VBE. So you have on top of that, you have some sort of a current source that, well, that doesn't work really. So you have to put a voltage source here to induce this IB. And that's what it is. So now from a small signal perspective, if you look at this, for example, the Pi model, what this looks like is that all the DC stuff go away, right? All the DC voltage sources become short and all the DC current sources become open. So you can think about this as some IB going into the transistor. So you have the R pi uh, sorry, you have the C pi, you have the R pi, and then you have the C mu, and then you have the GM, V pi, and then you have wh where should I connect the collector if it's connected to in the small signal model, if it's connected to VCC directly? What does it connect to in the small signal model perspective? A ground, right? Because it's zero. So this is IC that I'm trying to calculate. And this is the IB that's going in. So the question is, what is the transfer function of this thing? And it's relatively easy to calculate. And we'll talk about how do we calculate these things straightforward. And it's in your handouts too. But the short answer of it is that this thing, you can define the ratio of this as beta of S, 
is going to be beta 0, right, divided by 1 plus beta 0 c pi plus c mu over gm s. And this is simple from any kind of basic KVL, KCL calculation or, um, you know, nodal analysis that we'll discuss later. Anyway, so that's, that's what it is. So if you actually plot this versus frequency versus log of omega, what you will see is that it's going down like this. But the question is that when does it becomes, become 1? Well, you can easily see that for this to become 1, roughly this thing has to become equal to that. Right? So if these betas cancel, you can clearly see that ft is going to be 1 over 2 pi gm over c pi plus c mu, which is this is the ft. This is the frequency or omega t. 2 pi ft is that. So now let's look at that expression and see how it changes with the current, for example. So if you look at this expression, and let's see what our capacitances look like. So what is gm in terms of the current? We have derived an expression for gm, right? ic over vt. So it's proportional to ic. So this is ic over vt. What is, and there's a 1 over 2 pi, that doesn't really matter. And then what is C pi? What does C pi consist of? It has two parts, right? It has a junction capacitance part and a charge storage, base charge storage, Cb. And C mu is purely junction. So there's so, so, some junction capacitance total from both the base and the, from the emitter and the collector side, plus that, for, plus this guy. You can actually write it again as gm tau f, or you can write it as ic over vt tau f. So the key question for you is, how does, if I wanted to plot this ft versus ic, what would I get from this expression? When ic is small, what, do you expect, what would this look like? What would this FC be, uh, ft be? So the denominator, if ic is small, is dominated by the junction capacitance, right? So it would below, but it would increase proportionately with IC. At some point, this becomes comparable. And that at some point, this becomes larger than that. And when it becomes larger than that sufficiently, you can see that the ICs cancel. And you're basically getting 1 over tau f. So it flattens according to this model. Now, practically, what happens is this. Now, why does that happen is a device physics question. Because what happens is that, remember, the electrons are going from the emitter to the collector. right? So initially, they're going through the thermal energy. They're operating independently. But at some point, if your current is large enough, there's so many electrons here that their actual electrostatic charge will repel the electrons that are behind them. It's called the space charge effect. Kirk effect. So what happens is that you, this, this region becomes so negatively charged at any point in time that these electrons have a slight preference not to go that way and going this way. So it takes them longer to go across. So your tau f is actually increasing for an average electron to cross. Because there's a repelling force now pushing them back. So it takes an average electron a longer time to make a crossing. So tau f is going up, and as a result, the FT. So there's an optimum current for maximum frequency of operation. Now, a similar expression exists for MOSFET. For a MOSFET, again, FT would be 1 over 2 pi, exactly similar. So since the models are similar, C pi, we can call it CGS plus CGD. And now the question is, what is the dependence of these parameters on the voltages or currents? Now, at low, if you have no velocity saturation, let's write this as 1 over 2 pi. You have some C overlap plus what? Plus this expression, 2 third WLC ox, which can be dominated. Now, think about the expression for the long channel um, device, GM. 
So you have mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VT. So you can see the W's cancel, but you get a, an L squared in the denominator. So this becomes inversely proportional to L squared. And then what you have here in the numerator is VGS minus VT. And then, of course, you have the mu n and Z ox. So it tells you, if you might want to make the device faster, what is the parameter that gives you the most return first in a non-velocity saturated device? What parameter makes this number larger? Decreasing L. So that, you remember when we said the, sh the scaling helped a lot? You get an L squared. Why are you getting an L squared? You get one enhancement in the GM as you shrink your L, and you reduce your capacitance too. So you get an L squared. The other thing that you see is that you get an advance advantage from VGS minus VT, meaning that the more power you burn, the more overdrive you have, the more you have higher frequency you can operate. Of course, you have the mu n, so if you have something, a material with a better mobility or things of that sort, you can also improve the frequency performance. Now, if you go to a velocity saturated device, then Ft is going to be same expression, but Gm is going to have a different expression. So now you have 1 over 2 pi. This is going to be mu n C ox W E sat divided by, let's say, 2 thirds. Let's ignore the overlap for now. W L C ox. So the C ox is cancel, and the W's cancel. So you have some constants. And then you have mu n E sat divided by L. So now you see that you still get an improvement in the speed by making the transistor smaller. It's not going to be a quadratic improvement. It's going to be a linear improvement. And this improvement is mostly coming because of the reduction in the channel capacitance. Right? Now, of course, this reduction will go away if the second term, that C overlap, becomes dominant. At some point, if this becomes dominant, then this improvement will completely go away. You have no dependence with L. But if before that happens, you will have an improvement. Of course, mobility is there. If you can get better semiconductor material, that's always good or strain the silicon to do some stuff with that, and ESAT. But there is no other dependence. So you become more and more saturated in terms of speed. And that's what some of the most modern transistors have hit. Because now at, you're at the point that this, these other capacitances are so large that you're not dominated by this. And you, cannot, you may not be able to improve the cutoff frequency significantly by just scaling it down. So you have to do some other, play some other tricks for that. All right? So that, that's based the basic covering, coverage of the small signal model and what that leads us in terms of the lower frequency and higher frequency behavior. We'll apply these models extensively in design and analysis of circuits going forward. Any questions?